not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and of course we're on your smart speaker. Coming up, the Rwanda ruckus continues. The vote on Rishi Sunak's flagship policy drags on as we await a decision live right here. Fresh health concerns strike the royal family, sidelining King Charles and the Princess of Wales. So who will step up to fill those royal shoes? And Britain's strictest head teacher claims she was forced to implement a prayer ban at school after teachers were being racially harassed. Good evening, Britain, and welcome to the brand new 2024 version of the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. It's beautiful, isn't it? We've got an especially riveting two hours of top TV for you tonight with an amazing array of guests getting stuck right into it. We're talking a double royal health crisis, a conservative nightmare in the making over Rwanda, and the police under siege in a robbery epidemic in our capital. Plus, we've got Baroness Claire Fox with us to talk transphobia mania and the latest news from the front line of the gender wars. Dr Sebastian Gork is here from Washington, D.C. with why Donald Trump is nailed on as the next president of the United States. And I'll be hugging some complete strangers as well. Let's see how that goes. This is the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Look out below. Shockwaves hitting the news today with two major surgeries coming out of the royal household. The king will attend hospital to be treated for an enlarged prostate. Meanwhile, the Princess of Wales is recovering after planned abdominal surgery. That now leaves a gaping hole as the heir to the throne, William, steps aside to care for his wife. Joining me now, I'm pleased to say, the royal editor, Robert Johnson, who's with me for the first time in this brand new beautiful yeah. studio of ours. Yeah. Um, Blimey, what a day. I mean, who's going to take the reins now? I've got so many questions for you. Well, it's magnificent, isn't it, first great? of all. <laughs> I mean, it's perfectly, perfectly regal. I'm worried about the be. portraits. It's like Buckingham <laughs> Palace. I well, know. No, who, uh, the, king is, the king will still be uh, in, in charge. He's, yeah. only, he's going in next week. It's, uh, it's, it's quite a big um, uh, surgery, but it's um, a benign uh, prostate. And, you know, what he did, I think, was very good using his... His, his voice and his, um, his, his, his celebrity to sort of say, guys, go and get your... Yeah, cancer stage. charities are very happy with it. Yeah, I mean, doing, I think that's right? a fantastic thing to do. Right. And that was quite... And, you know, it's quite useful for them to give us that much transparency yes. on, a, on, on anything to do with health in the royal family. Right. So this, I think that was a good move by him. But it came, what, a few minutes or 20 well, minutes or this so was, after... this was what I wanted to ask you about, because, you know, when it st first started to, to, to appear to be... Um, the story was all about Kate. The yeah. Princess of Wales, and I came in and I was talking to Kevin O'Sullivan uh, on his show today, and I said, look, I don't want to pry into what is going on there because I think she's entitled to an element of privacy. They've said quite a lot about what it is. People can speculate if they wish. I, I don't particularly want to do that because I think she's entitled to, to recuperate and recover, but she's going to be out for a couple of months, so it's, yeah, it's, quite, quite, it's, it's quite, quite a serious yeah. thing. And what yeah. we know, for example, I think is that it's not cancerous, right? Yeah, we do know that it's not cancerous, and that's not coming from any you know, nefarious means that's coming mm. from sources, i.e. aids close to yeah. her, have said that... They're happy to, to, rule to that share out, that, yes. To make sure that's what... I mean, but, you know, it's obviously quite significant. Mm. The palace himself called it a significant announcement. And, you know, the amount of time she's off, it means they're down... They were going to go to a uh, overseas trip, I think they were talking about, one of, one of the bases, mm. uh, military bases. And then there was a big trip to, scheduled in for early early uh, 2024 mm. to go to Ro Italy, to Rome. Right. So that's not going to happen by the look of it. Right. And so, you know, that does make you think that although they're saying this was planned, it depends, you know, that means it's not an emergency. Right. It's an elective surgery, it's right? Yeah. She hasn't been out in public really since Christmas, has she? No, it's an elective surgery, but it means that, you know, the fact that those things were definitely going to happen right. as early as probably a couple of weeks or well, a week or so ago it suggests that this is... A development mm. rather than it being like planned months. So yeah, well. so something maybe took a turn for the worse. Because my initial thought as well was, as, as I was sort of just we just finished doing that, went upstairs. Suddenly there's more breaking news about King Charles. I thought, blimey! Now 
is it possible that those two things are a complete coincidence? Because I don't think it is. And, well, I, and if it's not, I don't know. I mean, I don't believe the Palace would do that. Like, you know, they'd have a grid system here and they work out how right. they're going to announce it. I think it was done on purpose. Right. Um, not in any way. To, so I think the, the King, some things, was quite clever because it, it detracted from from the, the, the attention on Kate, which would have been... Yeah. Well, um, they sort of did both, didn't it? Because in one sense, if you just announced that the King was going in for a prostate um, procedure, might, people might have talked about it more in terms well, they would have of, done. you know, no, they would have is, done, he, yeah. is, is he in ill health? Is he, you all. know, he's older? Um, is there a problem? Is he going to go under some kind of anaesthetic, the general anaesthetic? I don't know if he is. I think he probably is. Um, and if they, they, I think yeah. if they'd announced that for, for only, then there would have been a lot yeah, more about him. They would have focused on his age and yeah. all, what's happening next. Right. But yeah, no, it's still quite, um, you know, quite a major moment because you got at the moment probably got four key royals, you know, the, the king and the queen and the prince and princess mm. of Wales. The two of them are going to be out of action for right. a while. Because um, didn't we have this happen after? I can't remember if it was after the coronation or before, where there was a bit of a row between Harry and Meghan and the, and the palace, where it was all about stepping up. Yeah, and so and they never and resolved so, it. No, and so Sophie um, stepped up to be the Duchess of Edinburgh. I yeah. Think. And then also um, you've got Edward doing more as well because I mean they were obviously wags. Well, technically, they're in the in the in the order. You know, they're higher up than Princess Anne, even though a lot of people would quite like to see Princess Anne yeah. as the council of state. They will, you know, technically, if say the king is not able to fulfil his duties, which he will be able yeah. to, um, and, and that William will then, as council of state, will will step will step up, but also as heir. Right. But after that, you you're looking at. Um, You've got um, Edward and so Edward, as, and uh, then of course you've still got Andrew and right. well, Edward, a Andrew and um, Harry and as Harry, councillors presumably. of state. That's right. They still are. So Harry still has a possible role then. I can't see it happening. No, because he's not a working royal, nor is Andrew. But they are still on the. Say, and say this had happened, and William was out of the country, mm. say in Italy on that mm. tour. Then they would have required a, you know, then the council of state dealing with business at home right. would have to be most likely be Edward. Right. But you know, you are coming then dealing with Andrew saying, Well, I'm a council of state, and Harry said, So yeah. am I. Yeah. I think they should just resolve that and stop messing They really around. should. And who resolves that then? Is it the king that resolves it or is it well, the council? Well, it would have to be, it would have to be Parliament. Mm. I mean, but they, they don't really want to get involved in it, and the king doesn't want really. But you can imagine the whining it. that would come from Montecito. I, I think they should just know. come out with it straight and say, Look, if anything happens to William, Anything happens to the king, then can we please have Princess Anne step in and yes. George is all old right. enough? See, I thought they'd done all that. I didn't realise no, it wasn't resolved. No, it's not resolved. Because, I mean, one, you can't imagine Harry deciding to jump on a plane and come over uh, to see his dad, even though, you know... It would know, be nice, wouldn't it? It would be nice, and I don't, I don't really see it happening. But you can imagine if there was some kind of act of parliament that was passed, the whining that would come out of Montecito. And now they've even made us outlaws, you know? We would have a lot to chat about if that happened. We would. I mean, that would be good. <laughs> and also, people were saying to me today in, in the office, you know, well, what about Andrew? You know, is he... Because he's still clearly... Technically, he's still a council of state. So the, so the, the problem with all of this is that it's a, it's a bit of a mess. Mm. And instead of it being a mess, they should... Instead of saying, oh, well, the old way is like this, they say, well, this is the right. new reign, this is the new way, the rule, this is the order of precedence. And clearly, you know, even th there's been a change in the law of male primogeniture so that... You know, Charlotte will right. go ahead of Louis. So if this is the case, why not just say, look, anything happens to William or, 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 or Charles, in the greatest scheme, of the Princess Anne, Princess Royal steps in yeah. in a sort of regency role. Right. And I think pretty probably most of the country would agree with they that. They would do. Because when things like this happen, it's when you suddenly realise that it is still quite an arcane business and it's still quite well, a weird Instead of looking over world. what the funny rules were, look at what people would expect. Yes. Would they actually, in all honesty... I mean, I think that Edward and Sophie are great, they're great, but would they really expect or accept Edward and Sophie to step up? Right. Probably not. Mm. And would they accept Anne? Yeah, yes, they would. Right. It just takes me back, and I know it's nothing like that, but but to, to the days of Ronald Reagan when he got shot. Yeah. And Al Haig, who was the sort of Secretary of State, suddenly just took he walked into the White House and went, I'm in charge, and everyone went, What? Are you? Really? And nobody really knew what <laughs> to say. That TV show, The President, yeah. isn't it? The guy that's dealing with the knows, housing yeah. policy suddenly becomes the president. But also, isn't it interesting? But that's why I find it fascinating that they decided to announce both of these things on the same day. Because, like you say, I mean, they must have had a grid, they must have worked it out, they must have decided... I think just get both of it do done, it. because they knew that the focus of the media would be on Catherine. Yeah. And then by doing that, just slipping the thing on the king, mm. because 
Ultimately, it's 24-hour news, people with mobile phones. It's just a king two going for one. into a hospital. People could easily yeah. take a picture. I mean, it's a sort of royal two-for-one, this, isn't it? Because, I mean, presumably <laughs> the main piece, if when, when in the old days when we were in newspapers, you'd be going, well, it's, it's got to be got to be Kate, isn't it? So you'd end up, I mean, the Daily Mail will probably be in their absolute raptures trying to work out how do we get all <laughs> well, of this exactly what's page wrong one. With all that. But I think that actually with Kate is quite serious. I mean, you know, there's obviously the fact that she's had the, um, uh, the procedure, the surgery, and it's successful. But, you know, 40, 10 to 14 days in hospital, Very followed by time. recuperation of till after Easter. Yeah. That's a long time. And it is wish, a long time. And we wish her all the best. Because, of course. you know, it's going to be... You know, it's, it also, then you've got William, who they say hasn't got much back in terms of staff. He's got his nanny, but he, he's actually taken time out as well. And the kids are still quite young, aren't they? I mean, yeah, she, I, mean, I said yeah, in, in the yeah. intro, I mean, she's still a young mother. You know, she's not... Yeah, they're, you know, they're young, you know, the mm. little ones. So they, he's going to have to deal with that and their worries for her. So, mm. yeah, it's, it's a... But what it has done, I think, is sharpened a lot of people's minds, as you've said, well, what happens? Just yeah. What would happen, you know? seems that the only active, really active royal, royals are going to be the Queen, right. Camilla, plus um, uh, Edward and Sophie. Yeah. You know, I mean, I guess, it, you know. I mean, I guess Charles will be OK, but, I mean, yeah, we're still be... waiting. We're waiting for the Rwanda results tonight and it looks, by all intents and purposes, it's going to go in Rishi Sunak's favour. But if it wasn't to go in Rishi Sunak's favour and somehow, somehow suddenly, right. um, you know, the, the government has to be dissolved and somebody has to go to, to the king and, and say, can I form a government? And he's not there. Well, as it stands, they do then? Presume it have to, they'd have to go to him. Well, you know, we know he's a workaholic. He probably yeah. used to, just before he goes in, he'd be going through his red right. boxes and... Uh, and does he actually technically go under as anaesthetic? We don't know that yet. It's but just a we local... know it's an in... Well, I don't, it's difficult to know, isn't it? Because the treatment for an enlarged prostate can be anything from, you know, taking the drugs or yeah. shrinking it with a, yeah. with a laser or two. But, you know, we're told he is going in and right. so therefore you've got and to... And he'll probably be in overnight. I would think so. And yeah. in terms of security for something like that, how does that work? Because Same she's way. in a London clinic. I mean, yeah. we may not know where he's going to go, or will he have a visitor as a doctor? I should imagine he'll be where they usually go to the Edward the Seventh, right. which is around the corner from the London clinic. Okay. Um, unless he's going to stay up in Scotland, it's quite possible he's getting the treatment. Yeah. There. Well, it said, but... I think, in something I read today, that that's where they discovered he had a problem. When yeah. he was in Balmoral. Well, in that case, there's a, there's a chance that he could have it dealt with there. Yeah. But normally. They, he would go to the Edward the Seventh. Right. There's no sort of royal hospital wing somewhere in. Well, that is really Castle. it. That's if you remember the Duke of Edinburgh and the Queen. Yeah. Everyone they always used to go to the right. Edward the Seventh. So I mean, I would have thought that that would where they would go. And yeah, there's private, private wing. But you know, it's, it is worrying, but it does sharpen minds. And I just think that um, you know, when you have a king who's over, you know, he's at his seventy fifth birthday. Yeah. It, and you've, you, you've got to start, I think, just being a little bit more sensible in terms mm. of the Constitution. And so of Parliament, nobody's, you know, we've just had, we've just, we've just lost a monarch, we lost yes. the Constitution. It does happen, you know, right. we've had it for so long, mm. everyone put it out of your mind. Of course. But, but you know, you, you have to be on your toes with right. these things. And I think he's cancelling a few meetings that he's got yeah, with, he will do, with yeah. heads of state and all that kind of thing. Yeah, so. but he's, you know, he's flat out by, you know, this, he does all these things. So I think that it's going to be, someone's going to have to step into that Position. Mm. I should imagine it. Yeah, it'd be William, but it's not exactly the right time for him to be doing it. No, he's got his three kids and his wife in hospital. Right, and it's going to be difficult next few busy few days for you coming up. I imagine. Well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Robert Jobson, thank you very much indeed. Um, we'll talk some more about this, of course, coming up a little bit later on in the show. You're watching uh, the incredible revamped Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up next, has the Rwanda rebel debate managed to sink Sunak's migration plans? We'll be speaking to our chief political commentator and getting the inside scoop from Conservative MPs down at uh, Westminster. We'll have the latest from there next. So don't go anywhere. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. 
The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. Yeah, it's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegan's about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Well, we're still waiting for a decision down in Westminster as MPs drag the vote on the Rwanda bill out tonight. The bill passed its first vote in Parliament way back in December, but its future was threatened this week in the House of Commons. Rishi Sunak's emergency legislation has split the party, with Tory right-wingers arguing it needed serious amendments to be successful. Talk to you, VC's political commentator, Peter Cardwell, is at the central lobby now for us. Peter, uh, what exactly is going on? This is taking longer, I think, than we thought. Uh, what are you hearing? Well, um, what I'm hearing at the moment and what you're probably hearing too is the division bell, which means that the vote on the third reading of the bill is now happening. So this is the final stage of the process and we should know in literally about 10 minutes time or so, maybe a bit longer, maybe 15, what exactly has happened with this bill. We think it's going to go through. Probably I was uh, chatting to and, and in the vicinity of a very senior rebel who was saying that there'd probably only be about six people who, six Conservative MPs who would vote against this. The big question as well is how many people will abstain uh, and that will be significant for the government as well. If you abstain you can actually go through both physical voting lobbies, you can both vote both for and against and we'll see what happens. But now I've got eight minutes, you can hear the bells behind me, the division bells and literally the house divides, they go through those division lobbies for I and no and then the Deputy Speaker will say what has happened and what the uh, result of this vote has been. It hasn't been just quite as dramatic an evening, Mike, as it was yesterday, although we have seen the biggest rebellion from Conservative MPs. Just one more MP, 60 rather than 59, voted for one of the amendments brought by Robert Jenrick, the former immigration minister, and he brought an amendment essentially to say that judges, uh, these sort of pyjama injunctions, as they call them, these late-night uh, judges saying that flights can't take off for Rwanda. So that was quite a controversial part of this, and that was defeated very heavily defeated, but in terms of the uh, in terms of the number of Conservative MPs who defied the government to do that, just one more than last night. So there is ser seriously still a group of Conservative MPs who are not happy with the bill as it stands. But will they vote against? Well, I don't think so. I think we're going to have that number of about 59, 60 actually collapsing to about six or seven 
MPs. We'll know in the next few minutes exactly what those numbers are and we'll know about 10 minutes after that who those people are. Now, there are some people on the record at the moment who say that they will vote against this bill. Simon Clark, for example, the former Housing Secretary. Uh, there, are, there are about five or six people. Miriam Cates, uh, no stranger to Talk TV. Of course, she's the leader of the New Conservatives, uh, sort of breakaway group, subgroup of Conservatives. She said that she was thinking strongly about it. But whether people actually go through the lobbies to defy Rishi Sunak on this particular piece of legislation, especially as it is a very significant piece of legislation and it would, in theory, uh, mean that people are actually sent to Rwanda. So people can say to their constituents, yes, we want to strengthen this bill. We've given the government a bloody nose. They have been told that they wanted it to be stronger, but actually at the end of the day, they weren't going to vote against the government. Now, if the government were to lose this vote, I don't think it's going to happen, but if the government were to lose this vote, this would be the first time since 1977 that a government had lost a vote at this stage of the process. It's called third reading. I'm just going to quickly look behind me. I can see some MPs are... Uh, or um, congregating now as they go. They've got eight minutes to go through the voting lobby. You see the, uh, I think that's the former Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, uh, Sir Brandon Lewis, there just uh, about to go through the lobby. So really from right across the parliamentary estate, people are descending now for this very significant vote. And this is, yes, a bit later than we thought it was going to be. Uh, Parliament usually ends around 7, 7.30 on a Wednesday evening. But now, of course, we're about two hours later than that because there were so many amendments. There were so many attempts, not just by Conservative rebels, but also by the SNP, by Labour, by others to bring various amendments, all of which were debated today, but only a few were voted on. But those votes take time and the parliamentary process takes time. So what happens now when this goes through, as I expect it will, in the next few minutes? Well, it goes to the House of Lords. There are uh, lots and lots of people in there who are not happy with this. There are Labour Liberal Democrats, uh, there are many Conservatives with a legal background not happy with this bill either. There's also uh, quite a few people who are bishops and um, members of the clergy who are unhappy. For example, Justin Welby, who has made his, his views very, very clear on this Rwanda plan. Interesting today as well in, in uh, Davos at the World Economic Forum, because we had Paul Kagame, the leader of Rwanda, saying Quite, quite weirdly, actually, saying that he would happily give back the £240 million that Britain had already given Rwanda on this if the scheme wasn't going to work. So it's hard to see what, and how in any way that's helpful to Rishi Sunak, especially as he staked really his political career on this. Certainly, uh, this, I think, as I say, I think this will go through. I think it'll be fine. But there is a world of pain in the House of Lords, and especially when you have the leader of Rwanda saying those words today in Davos, sounding not particularly enthusiastic about this plan, which certainly uh, it would give credence to the thought that the Rwandans are perhaps not, perhaps thinking of backing out, or at least not as enthusiastic as they once were in this. Yeah. We'll see what happens, of course. But for Rishi Sunak, yes, there's been a major blow to his uh, to his uh, authority this week, but it looks as if in a few minutes time he'll squeak through yes it looks very much like he will squeak through and we'll bring that obviously to you here on talk tv as soon as we can but peter let me just ask you this you know it doesn't feel like a victory really for rishi sunak because not only as you say are the rwandans not all that happy about it the house of lords are going to give him some trouble and also you've got the dup in northern ireland saying that there's going to be another sea border created by this you've got the snp saying we don't want it in scotland it's human trafficking by rote um you've also got uh, the, uh, the sort of the PR campaigns turning a little bit nasty today with that uh, uh, tweet that was put out by the Conservatives, better call Keir uh, as opposed to better call Saul. Um, yeah, are you a terrorist? Are you in need of legal advice? Uh, they're accusing him of being in bed, really, with the terrorists. It's been a really nasty couple of days here in Parliament. We saw very bruising Prime Minister's questions earlier when it got very personal between Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak. Very interesting you mentioned the SNP there as well. Actually, Alison Thulis, who is their Home Affairs spokeswoman, she said that the government is now a criminal gang. She said they were not actually cracking down on criminal gangs, but the government, because in her view, it's breaching international law, something denied by the Home Secretary, yeah. James Cleverley, in Parliament this evening. Alison Thulis believes that the government is now a criminal gang. So that kind of language just shows you, and all the things you've just mentioned there, Mike, just show you how very, very 
down and dirty this is getting. We're in an election year now, I remember, and there are a lot of people who want to do all they can, especially the SNP, who tried to force quite a few more votes than actually happened tonight, want to show again and again that they wanted to vote against this policy. So there are lots and lots of different factors here, but really for Rishi Sunak, his own party has been the factor that's been most problematic for him in the last couple of days. And the uh, tr trouble with this bill is really only just beginning, as I say, before it goes to the House of Lords, which is the next stage in the legislative process. Yes, and you mentioned the 50 or 60 or so um, rebels from last night. I understand there was a meeting that was held today in one of the committee rooms in which there were a lot of unhappy Tory MPs, as you indicated, but they decided not to vote against the government. I mean, Nadine Dorry said to me last night, this is probably how it would play out. She said they'd probably all fold in the end. But what is it that they were offered by the government uh, to make them kind of cave in? Yes, well, that meeting happened about five o'clock in uh, committee room 20, not far from where I'm standing here in the House of Commons, and there were about 30 of the rebels, so fewer than those who voted against the legislation. Now, uh, unsurprisingly, the government tried to give them a little bit of sucker earlier this evening. They published a letter saying that Home Office civil servants would take what's called ministerial direction. So there's this big question about if it's against international law, do civil servants de defy international law, or do they do what they're mi do they do they um, obey international law or do they do what their ministers tell them and in government something called a ministerial direction is basically an instruction from an elected minister to do what you're told no matter what the consequences and the government released a letter earlier this evening saying that's what would happen and that those civil servants would be told what to do and no matter what the interna or what international law said that it would uh, that people would be deported to Rwanda so that is just a little bit of what the rebels wanted but Nadine Doris is right and this happened about a month ago as well, if you remember, this is now the, the part of the legislative process, it's called the third reading. At the second reading, about a month ago, just before Christmas, they had this uh, situation where there's a bit of a capitulation, quite frankly. There were a lot of people who said, yes, we'll vote, for example, on the amendments today, but they're not actually going to defy, defy the government on this. So we'll see if there are those sort of five or six people, I predict fewer than ten, will get the result in a few minutes' time, and we'll see just exactly who. Uh, divide the government in this and also what the government is going to do about it is Rishi Sunak going to take the Conservative whip away from them I think that would be uh, really bad for him politically as well also the positions of people like Brendan Clark Smith and Lee Anderson who resigned as deputy chairman of the Conservative Party yesterday as well so it's really interesting to see sort of what happens next with Rishi Sunak or whether he tries from a party management perspective just to suppress this down a little bit and to say to the rebels do you know what you've had your moment but actually now this is through Let's get on with it. Right. Well, because some people were saying, the Tory kind of government loyalists, if you like, were saying, surely it's better to have something rather than nothing. But I'm not sure that this is something rather than nothing. Um, so, Peter, listen, thank you very much indeed. We will carry on and we'll hear from you, I'm sure, when we get the result. Peter Cardwell reporting live down there uh, in Westminster in the central lobby uh, with news that the vote is underway. We should know in somewhere between five and ten minutes' time which way it's gone. But my question would be, does anybody actually really believe inside of the Tory government that anybody's going to Rwanda anytime soon. Let's talk now to immigration lawyer, uh, Mr Ivan Sampson. Ivan, welcome to the um, uh, big and uh, much more expanded independent Republican Mike Graham. We've got uh, some amazing uh, pieces of furniture around us since we last spoke. Um, I don't know whether this is a win for Rishi Sunak or not. Everyone's saying it's likely that the bill will pass. But, I mean, do you, for example, believe that anyone will go to Rwanda in the near future? Look, we've had this conversation many times over the past year, and I've said time and time again, um, no, because it will get clogged up in the courts. Um, the government is trying to shackle the courts. It's trying to... Um, look, it's the first time in history that a government has had to uh, tr attempt to enact a bill to declare a country safe. It's having to do that because of the Supreme Court rulings, which is in back in December, which says it wasn't safe. So it, it, it sort of, uh, there's a doctrine of separation of powers. And what that means is that the legislature, the executive and the judiciary have this separation of powers. This is to stop the abuse of power, to stop government enacting bills which are clearly unlawful and conflict with their international obligation, which is what's happened at the moment. This bill is, in effect, unlawful because it's a conflict between 
what it's trying to do. And the government, look, Parliament can enact any law for it, for domestic law, but it, what it can't do is then say that that law complies with international obligation, which is what it's done. And what 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 the bill is trying to do is to dis um, is to remove the Human Rights Act. So we have a set of human rights for us and a separate set of human rights for probably the most vulnerable people coming to our shores. And we're, 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 we're just removing them from the protection of those human rights. Well, it's, and that's slightly, it's a slightly more complicated um, version of events than that, though, Ivan, as, as you well know. For example, it was, the, it was the Supreme Court who actually said, in principle, they agreed with government policy that they could deport people who had come here illegally. They just didn't fancy the idea of them at the moment, deported them to Rwanda because they weren't satisfied that Rwanda was a safe enough place. So the principle of removing people and sending them back to wherever they came from or sending them somewhere else is not in question. That is lawful. They can do that. And international law uh, in lots of places and lots of situations in Europe, as you well know, um, varies depending on which country you're in. So there's no such thing really necessarily as international law. Listen, I'm not defending the, the Tory government here. I think they made a complete, you know, dog's breakfast of this entire Rwanda situation because they've created a rod for their own back. They've insisted that they're going to carry on with it. Rishi Sunak has spent the best part of the last three years telling everyone he thinks it's a bad idea. Now he suddenly thinks it's a great idea. And I think in principle, an awful lot of people know that when you talk about some of the most vulnerable people uh, in the world, they're not necessarily arriving on these boats because we know, for example, that 17,000 of these vulnerable people have now disappeared into the undergrowth, if you like, of Great Britain and nobody knows where they are. And we can only hope that they're not doing anything which might be in some way dangerous for our society. So something has to be done. And unfortunately, um, the lawyers and the people who will continue um, to fight uh, uh, the government on this... Oh, hang on, we've got a verdict coming up. Let's go live to Westminster. The eyes to the right, 320. The nose to the left, 276. The eyes have it, the eyes have it. Look! Yeah. I'll just let the chamber clear and then, and then we'll go. Thank you, that's a good idea. Looks as though the uh, win has come for Rishi Sunak. He doesn't look particularly triumphalist. It's a shame that, uh, Ivan, I thought my soliloquy was far more important than the actual announcement of the, uh, the vote. But, uh -huh. but never mind. Um, let's just go very quickly back to Peter Cardwell. Peter, tell us what that actually meant. Well, we don't know quite yet because we don't know how many Conservative uh, rebels there were, but certainly a victory for the government. And we'll know when the breakdown comes through in a few minutes' time how many Conservative rebels there were, but certainly a victory for the government, a majority for them, and not nearly the catastrophic result that was worried about at the time. So Rishi Sunak will probably breathe a sigh of relief rather than looking particularly triumphalist with this. But yes, the government's Rwanda bill has got through this stage and now it goes to the House of Lords. Thank you very much indeed. Um, one quick word back to, to you, Ivan, because I wanted to get your um, comment on what I was saying there. You know, something has to be done here. You and I have had differences of opinion about it all, all the way along. Um, this is not the answer, is it? Let's face it. It's not. And, and look, we have a constitutional crisis. I don't think you understand. I mean, this bill is... It's, it, it, it's, it's a central plank of the government's policy. But will it work? Very unlikely. Very because unlikely. only if... I, about 500 people going to get sent to Rwanda. Is that going to stop the small boats? It won't. But what's really worrying, this is what worries me, is the government is saying to the courts that oh, we want you to ignore what the evidence is. We want you to ignore your previous ruling. We want you, you to ignore expert evidence of whether Rwanda is safe and apply what we say in, in this, um, the safety of Rwanda asylum and immigration bill, that we say it's safe, when it's not safe. Well, to be fair, I mean, it, Ivan, it, hang on. It, it, to be fair, Ivan, hang on a second. Ivan, the United Nations says it's safe. They've sent refugees there. 
Uh, the Scandinavian countries of Norway and Denmark have also sent people there. Libya have also sent people there. And Israel has also sent people there. You know that as well as I do, so don't try and, you know, scurry around the truth. And also, there are plenty of very top legal brains who are advising the government on this who are also uh, of the opinion that it is entirely legal to do. But we're going to have to leave it there. We'll have to come back to you. Um, you'll have to get to us a bit quicker next time because I want to have a proper row with you. But we'll do it soon, I promise you. Ivan Sampson, thank you very much indeed. Immigration lawyer. Um, makes out that he's the only one that knows the law. Well, he isn't the only one that knows the law because, let's face it, there are plenty of legal advisers advising the government. The problem is not the law. The problem is the willfulness uh, and the kind of, shall we say, enthusiasm with which Rishi Sunak is trying to get this done. He's not getting it done. It's not happening. You're watching the fiercely independent Republican Mike Graham. Coming up next, should schools ban students from praying or well, Britain's strictest head teacher has been taken to court by a Muslim people for trying? Do not move a muscle. We'll be back in a moment. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. The rebellion consuming the Conservative Party over the Rwanda bill came to a head tonight, but not much of one. The Prime Minister fought on Conservative rebels as enough MPs backed his government's key safety of Rwanda bill at the third reading. Uh, those in favour, 320. Those against, 276. A majority of 44 for the government. We'll find out which Tory MPs actually voted against it, but there weren't very many of them. I'm joined now by the former Brexit Party MEP and Director of the Academy of Ideas and, of course, a member of the House of Lords, Baroness Claire Fox. Claire, welcome to the, uh, for the first time, I think, to the new... Um, the new studio. New and improved uh, Independent Republican Mike Graham. We're still <laughs> just as troublesome as we always were. Good to um, hear it. What a mess 
Sunak has made for himself. I mean, he's basically created this kind of, um, you know, issue that he said years ago he wasn't in favour of. He's pushed it to the limit to make it somehow a bill that now passes into law. He's going to have a fight with the House of Lords. He's going to fight with everybody else in the Tory party. And for what? Exactly. I think that the thing that's really galling is last night there was great almost excitement in yeah. the room that we had this big rebellion and that there was all these brave, mm. courageous uh, Tory MPs were going to go against, they're going to really fight on yeah. behalf of the people. Anyway, that ended with a bit of a damp squib because mm. in the end they haven't had the courage to go against the government. No. Having said that, having said that, this bill is bonkers. It is. Because what people want is for the government to control the borders yeah. and to deal with the boats. Right. And anybody sensible you talk to doesn't think that the Rwanda bill no. amended or not, either which way, whether you were Everybody's the rebels or not. Everybody's given up on it. Everyone is just like... And when you actually go and talk to... Um, uh, when I say go, go and talk to voters, but, you know, you talk to anyone, right, they'll just say they think that getting the bill through is what we want. Yeah. But, no, that it's become symbolic. Yes. And I think, by the way, when it gets to the Lords, I'll find that symbolism will annoy me because all of the people arguing against the bill will be people who do not believe that the um, control of borders is an issue no. and will try and delegitimise anybody as uh, 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 worrying about, yes. um, you know, illegal migration or whatever. They'll try and characterise those as, you know, xenophobic, mm. ignorant yeah, people. the right? usual stuff. Usual. Yeah. So I'll then start, myself, I'll then start ending up saying, how dare right. you? Of course. Having said that, and, and of course, by the way, I want to stress the international, uh, the, the, the promotion of international law to stop a democratic decision is outrageous. It is. But I just don't want this bill to be the issue. Well, exactly. I've just heard the same nonsense from Ivan Sampson, who's an immigration lawyer, who I have plenty of rows with, and another one tonight, because he is of that uh, school of thought, which is that, you know, uh, we shouldn't be interfering with the, le the legal process. You know, Parliament is not able to change international law. Well, it is, actually, and I don't actually accept that, that that's the legal position because, yeah. again, he is one of those who says, all oh, these are all terribly vulnerable people. Well, 17,000 of these vulnerable people have now disappeared but it's also into the, the countryside. I, I think it's been interesting, Mike. I don't know if you've been following what's going on in Ireland at the moment. Yes. But I think it's interesting that a county council, Mayo County Council, has actually just... Um, voted that they're going to cut off cooperation with the Department of Integration, it's yeah. called. Because they're basically saying, can you stop sending people here well, in these over circumstances? Place, but the thing that I, I liked about what the councillors across the party said mm. was they say, it's not fair on the people, it's not fair on the refugees or asylum seekers either, right. whichever state they are, because they're going to get blamed for everything. Mm. No wonder we're going to create resentment. Yeah. They're going to get escaped. But this is, again, I mean, going back to your time in, 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 uh, in Europe when you were an MEP, you know, this kind of project that's, that's gone completely haywire and wrong that started with Angela Merkel all those years ago when she decided it would be a great idea to offer asylum to anyone from Syria who was running away from a horrible war. And everybody went, yeah, I'm from Syria. And suddenly there was a million people coming into Germany. And we've never recovered as Western Europe. I think that the, one of the things that I'm sure that you know, you'll discuss with... Uh, you've got a really great panel on later, and I know they've got very strong views on this, but what I think is we need to actually have a sovereign policy mm. on what refugee status is. Yeah. Make a decision ourselves well, as a country. they're doing it in Germany, country. they're doing yeah. it in, in Italy, and they're doing it in France. There is no doubt about it. The sense of uh, fleeing from uh, a war and terror is still happening in parts yeah. of the world, but we associate that, and we do associate it with post... The Second World War, people trying to get out of Nazi yeah. Germany or escaping right. the horrors of Stalinism mm. or whatever it is. And that's what the Refugee Convention was. Things have changed and mm. you do have to say, well, let's talk about it now. You'll know. I mean, the House of Lords, by the way, it's not just like people flying. Well, the big thing everyone says is climate change. Mm. There's lots of climate refugees. And we're told that we've got to accept that the world is now full of people yeah. who need to come I mean, here. It's nonsense. And, and, and what I think it's discredited yeah. the honourable, generous, uh, historic way that we've welcomed yeah. refugees. And I think we should continue to do that, but not 
just because people have called but them refugees. But not en masse, and not when no. we've got a million people coming legally as well, yeah. in addition to all of but that. But also because they, bla they absolutely gaslight people and yeah. say, when people say, well, I don't think they are legitimate refugees, they say, how dare right. you say that, you racist. It's like, right. so you're not allowed to challenge No, it. it's yeah. nonsense, absolute yeah. nonsense. Yeah. And let's have a look at one of the, sort of, I suppose you might say, the following on subjects from that. Catherine Burble Singh, front page of The Telegraph today. Uh, we've been talking about it all day on Talk TV. Um, there's a lawsuit going on because she runs a very successful school here in London uh, in which she does not practice praying. She does not accept praying from any form of uh, religion, regardless of what form that religion takes. Of course, it wouldn't surprise anyone to know that some Muslims have objected to that and they've gone to court to try and force her to let them pray. There's a number of interesting things here. I mean, first of all, it's quite... Only, I think that probably people would have associated Catherine Burble Singh's school with the kind of school that would everyone would be praying, yeah. you know, and sending the Our Father every right. morning. You know, House of Lords, they start mm. with prayers. Yes, right. Because the bishops are in there and they need prayers every mm. day. And uh, actually, sometimes they go in, it's nice to have a quiet few moments, mm. right? Um, but Catherine Burble Singh has actually said no prayers of right. any denomination. Right. She wants people... Which sounds fair to me. She wants people to forget what ethnicity they are or what religion they are when they go in the school and mm. just concentrate on, as she says, being part of a country, being part of a school. She says country. She says that's the thing that's beyond you. You live in Britain. Yeah. And we then want you to concentrate on acquiring the knowledge that we think a, a, a citizen yeah. of this country should have. And then they teach them very well. So that's that. And she's in this ridiculous position now where the usual people who would be saying we shouldn't have prayers in schools, mm. we should. how dare we have the indoctrination of religious schools, right. are now demanding that we give prayer rooms yeah. and regular prayer sessions to these pupils. We have to say that over half of Catherine Burblesing's school are Muslims. Right. And as far as I can see, most of them are not demanding prayer rooms right. or demanding prayer No, times. they're not. It's also and the case that parents. most parents are begging Catherine Burble Singh to let them get into this school. Mm. So this appears to be a group of very entitled young people. Mm. And we know who basically say, give us what we want yes. or else. Or else. And, and I'm afraid, you know, the, the, this time it's because they're Muslims and mm. that is a real problem in this, because we know that you'd be frightened of being called Islamophobic. Yes. There's an atmosphere there. But it's also the case that in another school, it could be that they demand that they have, you know, regularly... Uh, I don't know, net zero, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. kind of... Uh, Stations uh, uh, of the yeah, cross, no, exactly. why not, you know? Do you see what I mean? I, yeah. I, just, I just want to say that it's on this instance about religion. But I'm doing a, a talk tomorrow on uh, religious education at the House of Lords. There's a kind of debate. And it's all this, how can we encourage people to be RE teachers? They're saying, give them a bursary, mm. do this. I was thinking, who'd be an RE teacher? I know. Religion has become a politicised identity. Exactly. Yeah. I'm going to use that very example. Yes. You know, that people are frightened that they're going to put their foot in it. There was a, a Christian uh, 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 reverend who gave a sermon in a Christian school. He was uh, reported to prevent yeah, I know. the anti-extremism thing. So It's yeah. just mad, isn't it? Listen, um, as ever, we, 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 we haven't got enough time to do all this stuff. We'll have to come back. Claire, great to see you. Um, look forward to you. hearing about the talk tomorrow as well. Claire Fox there, uh, the Baroness, the very sensible Baroness. In fact, she's not a member of the uh, of the Cabinet here at the Independent Republic. <laughs> You're watching the bold and the brilliant. And it's not just Claire Fox. We've got loads coming up after the break. We'll be explaining why planned interest rate cuts are now in doubt. Plus, a not-to-be-missed edition of Taking the Mic. So don't touch your remote. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using Excel bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. 
Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now, it's time for Taking the Mic. Now, there can't be many people who didn't wince slightly when they heard the news today about the Princess of Wales and the health problems that are going to keep her out of action and out of the public eye for the best part of the next two months. The news about her abdominal surgery would elicit a good deal of sympathy, and so it should. After all, she's still a young mother and she is to be the Queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland at some point in our futures. Then we were told of an even more shocking revelation about her father-in-law, King Charles, who will likely spend a night in hospital next week as he receives a corrective procedure to treat an enlarged prostate. Men of a certain age will know exactly what that is like. And indeed, prostate cancer charities are already praising him for raising awareness for men to get themselves checked. For Kate, she will be receiving the very best of care at the London Clinic, and that is as it should be. Here at the Independent Republic, we wish her all the best for a speedy recovery. And I'm certainly not one of those that will demand to know every detail of what is clearly a private matter. The King similarly will be treated by the very best doctors that money can buy. Not for either of them, the uncertainty of being treated on the beleaguered NHS. Not for them, the inconvenience of having procedures cancelled, postponed or simply forgotten about. I was struck by the contrast of what we would be reporting on if there was only one health system in this country, take it or leave it, if there were striking doctors affecting what outcomes these two senior royals might expect, and if shortages of drugs and other medicines might affect how quickly they might recover. And then I read the experiences of our current health secretary, Victoria Atkins, today. She was speaking at the Women's Health Summit about what she went through while trying to give birth to a son. She described the NHS ward where she was taken with pregnancy complications like one of the dark corners of the health service. She talked of new mothers suffering hellish agony and in pledging to improve maternity care in the NHS, she says it is a top priority to ensure that others do not face the fear that she faced. She talked of how unprepared the hospital was to deal with a woman with pregnancy complications and her story will be a familiar one to anyone who spent time in an NHS hospital in the last five years. Our nation has begun to admit that our health service isn't the best in the world. It's very far from it. But isn't it time the NHS itself began to fix itself? Perhaps if more politicians were forced to use the NHS, it might get better a whole lot quicker. Now, Britain's rate of annual, uh, annual rate of consumer price inflation rose unexpectedly to 4% in December, the first increase for 10 months. This uptick is expected to complicate the timing of planned interest rate cuts from the Bank of England. Tobacco prices increased by 16% on the year. Luckily, I don't smoke anymore. But alcohol was up 9.6% on 
and broadband prices are going to jump as well. Joining me now to make sense of it all uh, is the editor at large of The Money Mentor at the Times, Georgie Frost. Georgie, welcome. Good evening, Mike. Nice to see you. Thank you. Are you still smoking? Is smoking going to affect you? Not after prices? these price rises. No. no. I mean... Dry January is a great time as well, <laughs> I have to say. I have to say, I'm absolutely always staggered by finding out how much things cost. I think people are just taking the mickey now. They're just going, I'll tell you what, see that bottle there, that bottle of gin, it used to be 15 quid, we're going to make it 25. And people will just buy it. Well, yes, that is true. But I also think the government putting up uh, alcohol and tobacco duties yeah. uh, also had quite a big impact as well. I mean, a yeah. lot of the producers have been criticised. Brands have been criticised for putting up prices more than they really need to during right. the cost of living crisis. So, yeah, absolutely. That would have fed into inflation. Mm. Absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, people have said that, or certainly Rishi Sunak has said, that they're bringing inflation down. I mean, we know we didn't really have them to thank for it going up. Um, yeah, apparently they, the plan is still on course as well. Well, they keep Even saying it's gone up. Yeah, they keep yeah. saying they've got a plan. Yeah, um, but they, they were telling us just before Christmas that inflation was coming down, weren't they? So this is the problem with taking ownership when something falls in the right direction. Yes. Is you sort of have to take ownership when it goes in the other direction. Mm. I think we're all a little bit surprised yes. by today's very tiddly increase mm. in the uh, CPI rate of inflation. You know, it's disappointing for everyone, of course. We, we all want to see inflation go towards target, that's yeah. 2%. But it doesn't it doesn't really put a setback as, into what the Bank of England's mm. going to do next. The Bank of England have said the whole way through, hold on a minute, everybody's getting a bit carried away. I was mm. hearing six base rate cuts next this year, actually. Six? Six, I mean, please. Well, we then did it have went 13 to five, rises, then it went to didn't four. we? We had 14 rises 14. of the base rate, absolutely up yeah. to 5.25% in August, and it's been held mm. while the Bank of England are just assessing the economy and what happens and what happens with inflation. Because, of course, that's what they've been doing it for. They've been raising rates to bring inflation mm. down. Not quite sure what the government has to do with it or Rishi Sunak. However, that's what the Bank of England can do about it. There are lots of other external factors going on uh -huh. which may impact what happens from this point on. We are still on target as everyone predicts, but as you know, economic forecasts yeah. are often wrong. I mean, the but Bank of England hasn't, target to hasn't get to played 2%. a blinder here, has it? I mean, I suppose a lot of people will be watching this going, what about mortgages? Is my mortgage going to come well, down well, this year or not? Exactly right. So as I said, look, we are actually lower than the Bank of England expected in terms of inflation. So no. while it's ticked up a little bit, we're still lower than we, where we thought we were, and we are still on target to get to 2%. Yeah. Be that as it may, there are lots of geopolitical factors going on in the world right now. What's mm. happening in the Red Sea hasn't filtered through. Those sorts of issues, Ukraine war still going on, tensions in the Middle East and closer to home. Right. We have coming in April, national wage rises, yeah. benefits going up. So I think the Bank of England will be looking at that very closely. The next meeting on the 1st of February, I can't think they're going to cut rates then. Mm. I don't I think all the noises say, look, you know, Hold steady. We need to see yeah. this come to a, a really stable place. Otherwise, what's the point? You're mm. seeing it all around the world as well. This path to a 2% target is going to be a little bit rocky. Yeah. So they don't want to disrupt the progress that we've made so far. So I think the first cuts are predicted to come maybe in May. Right. But of course, as you say, what does that mean for, for mortgage borrowers? Yeah. You know, those on tracker rates, which follow the base rate of mortgage, base rate of interest, of course, those almost 1.6 million people who are coming off their yeah. fixed rates will be looking at that going, what on earth misery. am I going to have yeah. to pay? Yeah. The good news misery. is there's a bit of a mortgage price war going on at the minute. Yeah. But look, if there's... There's another war going on at the minute as well. And we have to get out of this because we've run out of time. Oh, I'm sorry to say. That's but fine. listen, don't worry. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're watching the groundbreaking Independent Republic of Mike Graham. After the break, we're bringing you another hour of great content. Trump turns up the heat on President Biden as the Republicans continue their quest for candidacy in New Hampshire. Strap in. We'll be back before you know it. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. 
The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegan's about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republican Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and we're on your smart speaker. Coming up... The eyes to the right, 320. The nose to the left, 276. The eyes have it, the eyes have it. Look! Yeah. Alive but wounded, Rishi Sunak survives a crucial vote on his flagship Miranda policy but bleeds backers as 11 Tory rebels go against the government. Plus, an unprecedented royal health crisis as both the King and the Princess of Wales are admitted to hospital. And as Donald Trump's stock soars, his could-be rival Joe Biden hits a record low approval rating in a new devastating poll. So, that's it then. Really? The safety of Rwanda bill got through with the minimum of fuss and the maximum of hubris from those parliamentary types tonight. Don't say it was particularly unexpected or even particularly exciting. But as I predicted on the Independent Republic last night, Nothing has actually changed. The House of Lords is suggesting that they will be looking for more safeguards before nodding anything through. All of yesterday's rebels bar just over a handful failed to vote against it. They weren't happy, but after an emotional meeting in a Commons committee room, most of them decided it would be suicide to vote against the government. The DUP is threatening that the law will almost certainly isolate Northern Ireland again and leave a massive immigration border somewhere in the Irish Sea. The SNP has called it state-sponsored trafficking and says that Scotland doesn't want it. And even in Rwanda, there was a certain caution. President Paul Kagame has already intimated that if the law goes too far against individual human rights, Rwanda will not comply. And his spokeswoman confirmed that they would entertain a request for a refund of the 240 million quid they've received from the UK if no illegal migrants are ever sent there. And there are even those in Rwanda who are now complaining that their reputation is being damaged by all this dither and delay. All in all, it's a colossal fudge. I said fudge. One which will not result in a deterrent and one which is unlikely to please anyone. Government loyalists are busy trying to spin that it's better to have something rather than nothing. But in truth, and in this case, it actually isn't. 
The civil servants have been told they will have to ignore rulings from any European court and already their union reps are kicking off. Opposition MPs are making the Tories out to be a laughing stock and with that attack ad today, they're not exactly winning the PR game, are they? I mean, if even I don't think it works, then where on earth have they got to go? I'd be willing to make a bet with you right now. Before the clocks change, there will have been no actual migrants deported to Rwanda. In fact, there's more likely to be Rwandans being actually sent here instead. There was a lot of smoke, a lot of late-night calls, but in the end, Nadine Dorries was right. Last night, when she said it would all go through because MPs would move her wrong... They would make the wrong move on their own futures. It only remains now for the shutters to come down on the Rishi Sunak term of office, and if he's going home tonight thinking he won a victory, then it's a particularly pyrrhic one. He's only succeeded in convincing all of us that he's all about show and not about substance. I think his days are now numbered. Start counting. Later on in the show, we will be bringing you a first look at all tomorrow's front pages. Um, but, of course, before we do anything, we've got an exclusive look at the Sun newspaper. Uh, and it's all about Kate, as we suspected. Royals rocked by Kate Op is what it says. We'll be talking more about that, of course, with our panel as they come in, coming up a little bit later on in the hour. But right now, we're going over to the United States of America because Donald Trump has taken out the Iowa caucus and he's emerging, of course, as the clear Republican frontrunner. His soon-to-be rival, if you can call him that, Joe Biden, continues to tank. His own approval ratings are now at a 15-year low, according to a new poll by ABC News in America. Joining me now is... My former deputy assistant, of course, to President Trump, is Dr Sebastian Gorka. Seb, very good to see you. Welcome to the Independent Republican, Mike Graham. Greetings, greetings. The only host who knows how to use Pyrrhic victories uh, correctly <laughs> and then has to have a, uh, a uh, little warning on the use of the word fudge. Yes. I do remember a finger of fudge when I was a little kid. <laughs> I miss those little uh, chocolate bars. How are we doing? Can you just run for office and sort out Blighty? Come on, Mike. I mean, for heaven's Get sake, we've, we've literally spent all week talking about a bill which is going to do nothing to stop illegal migration, is going to do nothing to stop legal migration. We're going to have 10 million more people living here in about 10 years' time. We already can't see a doctor. We already don't have enough houses. You can't get a bloody train. You know, it's a nightmare, absolute nightmare. So, you know, immigration, which the lefties tell us doesn't matter, it's not a big deal, I'm afraid is going to sink Sunak, along with, uh, you know, his policies on what he can do about stopping these boats. Yeah, you, you and Nigel need to sort out the UK, but, but you know, you are in uh, far, far better waters than we are. So think about what's happening here in America. Uh, recently, we broke all world records. We had 12,000 illegals cross our southern border on one day. Yeah. Not a week, not a month, one day. And shockingly, you mentioned Iowa, well, shocking for the left, this historic victory for the president, the greatest lead anyone's ever had in that primary was 12 points. That yes. was uh, Bob, Bob Dole. Uh, president Trump <laughs> won by 31 points. 31 points on Amazing. Monday night. Yeah. And, and more women voted for him than men, which tells you this garbage about the suburban housewives don't like his tweets, truly is garbage. Mm. But here's a fascinating thing. What was the top issue? Iowans, who aren't exactly on the border, they're right. not in Texas, what was the number one issue Iowans said as they came out of the, the polling stations and they chose President Trump? Immigration, yes. Mike. Yes. So whether it's the UK or whether it's here, people have said, basta, enough. Yes. Because they're right to say that. I mean, I've been hearing some incredible stories, so we haven't had a chance to talk about it, but, you know, there are people from sub-Saharan Africa turning up at the Mexican border with the United States of America. This is a business we're dealing with. This is, this is organised. It is a multi-million pound business every single day of every single year. And it all started with Angela Merkel in Germany, yeah. you know, the, the, the creator of the European superstate, when she said, oh, you're from Syria. Come on in, because you need some sort of sanctuary from that terrible war. And guess what? It was like um, I am Spartacus. Everybody went, yeah, I'm from Syria. I'll, can I come in? And, you know, and now you know, look where we are. I'll, I'll send you a photograph that, that one of our congressmen posted last week, uh, the great Matt Gates. It's a photograph from the Border Patrol from an unnamed source that has hundreds of passports strewn on the other side of the border. Why? 
because they come across pretending to be Mexicans. Yeah. They're Venezuelan passports, they're Haitian passports, mm. and they say, oh, oh, I, I'm pleading asylum. We don't know who these people are. No. The latest estimates are that it's 8 million that have been let in in three years. I would say you can probably double that because there are people that we don't even know cross the border. Yeah. 16 million... If you think of 9-11, 9-11 was done by less than 20 guys. Yeah. If I'm ISIS, if I'm Hamas, if I'm Al-Qaeda, if I know the border is open, what am I going to be doing, Mike? I'm going to be flooding the zone with my bad guys. That's why borders matter. There is no nation that doesn't police its borders. If you don't have borders, Mike, you don't have sovereignty. If you don't have sovereignty, you don't have a country have no control over anything. I mean, look at the state of London. I saw, shamefully, uh, a place where I used to live not far from, Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York City on the Upper East Side, you know, a horrible, ghastly gang of masked thugs marching past, trying to frighten children, cancer patients, yeah. shouting free Palestine, you know, from the rivers to the sea and all that. In London, last weekend, they were shouting in defence of the Houthis in Yemen. You know, it's not good enough now to get rid of Israel as a state. They now want to support the Yemenis uh, and the Houthi terrorists, and they want Britain to stop attacking them, even though we are yeah. being attacked in the shipping lanes we of the Red Sea. We've had, and we've lost two brave SEALs, two, two of our Special Forces guys, um, preventing Iran from doing exactly that in just the last 72 hours. But one person here, one politician, has recommended the following, and I'd like to see a, a Brit with a spine in, in uh, you know, the Palace of Westminster come up with this. If, if you're an immigrant, uh, if you're there on some kind of visa, and you're caught at one of these pro-terrorist Hamas demonstrations, you should be deported instantly. Your, your feet mm. shouldn't touch the ground, and you should be shipped off to some godforsaken hellhole like Yemen, yeah. like Gaza. Get rid of those who don't believe in our civilization. Churchill was right. The English-speaking peoples are the greatest civilization the world has ever seen. If you're calling for their destruction, if you're on the side of the enemies of that civilization, you shouldn't be allowed to be there. It's that simple. Yeah. Are we trying to commit political suicide well, or not? The fact that you saying that is seen by some people as a controversial statement tells you how far we've fallen. It's absolutely right. incredible. Right. But watching Donald Trump in Iowa was, was fascinating and, 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 and very kind of, I think, thrilling for a lot of people who will see that the world has gone to something that I can't say, even though it is quite late at night, since he left, you know, because let's have a look at why Joe Biden is now so unpopular. Have a look at this. At White House Senior Living. Our yeah, so this is um, um, uh, Joe Biden, White House Senior Living. This is a video that was made to make him look even more ridiculous than he actually is. But you don't have to do much. This is Joe Biden, unable to eat properly, unable to put his jacket on properly, unable to remember who his wife is, unable to remember exactly where he's going. I mean, you don't have to have any fiction there behind that. That's all real footage of sleepy, yeah. creepy, crooked Joe Biden. We, we, we don't need to edit. There are no deep, deep fakes. That, that is the actual man who allegedly is the president of the United States. Let, let me just be clear to all of your amazing viewers and listeners. Uh, president Trump, my former boss, who's, you know, trouncing the current incumbent in the polls, he's more than 20 years older than me. So I'm 53. He's in his late 70s. <laughs> when I worked for him in the White House, Mike, if I had a quarter of his energy... I would be satisfied with that. Yeah. People always used to ask me, Seb, when it's 4 a.m., are you the one tweeting on the president's account? I said, are you kidding me? I need, <laughs> I need at least you know, five hours sleep. Right. It was him. This guy's a four... I don't know whether it's the Scottish, German, Irish genetics or something. The, the, you know, some people, like Maggie. Maggie allegedly sp yeah. s slept only four hours a night as prime minister. Some people are just born to lead. Yes. DJT is one of them. Churchill was one of them. Maggie was one of them. This is what our civilization needs the most. People who, who don't just have the energy, but have the love for their country and are prepared to take the slings and arrows. Simply the fact 
that he's facing 730 years in prison on trumped up charges from Democrat prosecutors from Georgia to New York, and he's prepared to put himself and his family through it again. That's love of country, Mike. Well, I saw um, uh, some more footage of him getting off a plane. I think it was after Iowa, and it was at something like 3.30 in the morning, you know, and, and the person who posted it was like, and I think it was, it was a Newsmax or somebody like that, saying, you know, Joe Biden calls it a day around about noon. When he's had it, when he's had his sort of tea and biscuits, Mike. and he's off to sleep because he's, and he hasn't made a statement, has he, about um, these missile attacks in the Red Sea? He's launching um, attacks on behalf of the nation of the United States of America, and he hasn't addressed the United States of America about it. He he has not, and he spent more time on holiday than he has in the White House. Mm. And if you talk to the insiders, just compare this to, to President Trump. Joe Biden gets to work at 10 a.m. and they, they, they have a close on media. They, they you know, shutter the whole White House at 2 p.m., mm. which if you actually do the math, that means he hasn't been on holiday for most of his presidency. He's barely been working if you're doing four hours of work a day mm. and the nuclear football is down the hole uh, down the hall the question is mike who's running the country who's well, really running the country because i guarantee you one thing as my good friend dan bongino former secret service agent says it's not the rotting bag of oatmeal in the oval office well, it seems extraordinary because it's also not the vice president. So who is the power behind the throne? You know, who's the guy operating the Wizard of Oz? Well, um, I recommend it maybe for another one of your, your shows. Go back to an interview with Obama after he left office. I'm not making this up. If you don't believe Seb, look it up for yourself. It's out there where Obama said, my dream would be to have a third term where I'm not actually the president, but I've got one of those little devices in the president's ear mm. and I'm just telling him what to do. Mm. Obama said that on camera, Mike. Yeah. Well, it's funny what they say on camera. I was revisiting uh, what Joe Biden said on camera about Hunter Biden um, in the presidential debate last time around when he more or less accused Donald Trump of making up lies and said that it was all a Russian um, uh, plot to discredit his son. And today, perfect segue, <laughs> the Department of Justice, in consequence of another investigation to do with Hunter Biden's evasion of millions of dollars of tax payments, actually admitted in the court filing, it's on my Twitter stream, uh, Seb Gorka, that the Hunter Biden laptops are Hunter Biden's laptops. That's Biden's D DOJ, Department of Justice. I mean, it, it's it's squirreled away in this filing. Yeah. But the, the laptop that we were told by Twitter, by Facebook, by the New York Times, by the Washington Post, by CNN, by the BBC, oh, no, these are not the droids you're looking for. That's Russian propaganda. Yeah. Biden's own administration has had to admit, yeah, 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 all that stuff with the prostitutes, the coke, the illegal gun purchases, the businesses with China... Yeah, it's all real. Perhaps the, yeah. one of the most corrupt political families in American history. And, you know, that's something, if you if yeah. you remember Hillary Clinton and Bill, that, that takes some doing. It really does. And yet, his poll ratings plummet. The Democrats don't seem to have any other clue as to what to do. Um, they know, they must know, they must have looked at Iowa and they must be looking at oblivion, staring down the barrel of a gun. You know, the, the trouble is these people don't live in the real world. I mean, I mean, really, when, when, when you're so isolated, when CNN tells you you're great, when MSNBC tells you you're great, when The Washington Post tells you you're great, when, when you're detached, when you've never actually had to, you know, buy petrol and fill a tank of petrol uh, in your own car, yeah. when you're getting Hunter Biden's son, just one stat, just one deal, Burisma, the most corrupt energy company in Eastern Europe, paid that guy for a no-show job. He never went to Ukraine, had no background in energy, didn't speak the language, paid him $83,000 a month because his dad was vice president. These people have no idea what the real world is like or what real, real mm. Americans are suffering from. We went from uh, petrol at $1.8, 180 per litre, to up to 7 dollars 
dollars per leader in California now. That's the real world. That's where most Americans live. Yeah. But if you're a, you know, a Democrat member of the com commentary at the talking classes, you know, you've got your uber black and you're just fine. Yeah, absolutely right. So on to New Hampshire. Um, what happens there? Well, um, if the if the president romps home again, then Ron DeSantis, if he's logical, which his ego may not permit him to be, has to stop his campaign. Because if he waits until Florida and he loses mm -hmm. against President Trump in the state of which he is a governor, that, that's, that's an embarrassment you can never recover from. Yeah. His political career is dead. Nikki Haley is being funded by rhinos and Democrats. She's actually admitted that. So she, she may just keep on going because she thinks, ooh, if President Trump ends up in prison, I get to pick up the pieces. So th this this is the level of moral turpitude we're dealing with, Mike. Yeah, it's a shocking state of affairs. But listen, great to talk to you, Sebastian. Keep up the good fight and uh, we'll see you very soon. Dr Sebastian Cheers. Gorka there, the voice of reason from uh, Washington, D.C., where there are not very many voices of reason, I can be sure to tell you that. Now, you're watching the one and only Independent Republican Mike Graham. Coming up after the break, uh, the Met is finally cracking down on Rolex robberies. And I'll be doing a tutorial on how to hug people. So don't go anywhere. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda zilt. The amount of money it's cost. We're saying, what are we saying? It's cost about 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. <laughs> Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years. Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> no. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. has revealed it's made a small dent into tackling crime on the streets of central London. Authorities released today a dramatic security camera vision from two operations where undercover cops caught robbers in the act as the criminals attempted to strip them of high-end watches. 
The crackdown has led to 31 arrests and currently 21 convictions. You can see uh, the police absolutely getting stuck into some of these characters, which I think is what all of us have been looking for for quite some time. Joining me now is former police detective, Mr Peter Blexley. Peter, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, it's quite heartwarming to see uh, good old-fashioned policing, as we call it. You see two guys walking down the street, clearly sort of um, as, as, as bait, if you like, for these horrible gangs who have been terrorising the West End for probably the best part of a, a good year, at least, where they literally just take anything they want and nobody can do much about it. But now, finally, something's happened. A wonderful bit of police yeah. work. Um, somebody from the Met said it was new. It's not new. Right. Undercover policing is decades old. Right. But credit where it's due. Mm. Long overdue, but very, very welcome. And the public today mm. have reacted so positively yeah. towards the Met Police. Finally, right. we've got a good news story for yes. the Met. And they love it. Because they're doing what they're paid to do, right? They're not dancing about with protesters. They're not giving bottles of water to just stop oil. They're not, you know, making sure that communities are in touch with their feelings. They're just robbing... They're just beating bad guys, basically. Police work yeah. and not social work. Yes. And that's what the public want. Mm. They've loved it seeing these robbers getting whacked, yeah. tasered, slung on the ground, right. handcuffed and carted. Yeah, rugby They've tackled. Absolutely loved it. Yeah. And that is what the public want. That's how their homes, their watches, their yeah. cars and everything else and their loved ones, yeah. that's how they want them protected. They don't want fluffy, yeah. they want robust. Exactly, and, and they want vis true. visible um, activity as well because, I mean, what that will do, hopefully, uh, is it might make these horrible, ghastly individuals who think it's all right to just rob people and rip them off and, and beat them up if necessary, well, maybe we shouldn't do that just in case they're coppers. Interesting note as we talk about mm. these despicable robbers. Yeah. 21 of them convicted. Yeah. All their pictures are widely out there on social media. Yeah. Not one white face yeah. among them. Really? So, yeah. Mm. So the trouble is the sentences are pretty paltry. Yeah. Um, and I think the longest one that somebody got was like two years and three months or right. something. So then. And not... is that because they don't mess, maybe they haven't got them committing anything before? It's a first time offence or something like that? Oh, they'll all plead that it was their first offence. Yeah. I'm sure of that. Yeah. Um, and of course, that's difficult to refute if mm. you haven't nicked them beforehand. Yeah. Um, however, Sentencing guidelines, prisons, young offenders institutes, all of those bursting yeah, yeah. at the seams. I'm sure that the sentencing guidelines have, have been a factor yeah. here. But let me tell you why it's so pointless to give somebody two years. Mm. They will only serve a year of that inside. Yeah. And then the second half of that sentence will be served in the community. Mm. Well, we all know the kind of communities they hang about in, yeah, don't well, we? Yeah, right. And so you're not confident then when they come back out then they won't actually just go back to what they were doing? Because the waiting list, generally speaking, mm. in a prison, to get on any kind of course, yeah. where it be vocational, educational or psychological, whereby you can confront your offending, yeah. admit your guilt and, and, and develop into a better human being, mm. the waiting list for those causes in prison is about a year anyway. Right. So, unfortunately, I feel they're just going to go to crime academies, mm. do their second year with their tag, yeah. wearing it as a badge of honour. Right. And if they're allowed to stay in the UK because they're British citizens, then I'm sure some of these people are, unfortunately for us, going to re-offend. But I wonder as well whether the police could learn something from the fact that because they're out there on the street, this is the way that they can win against crime because I've been seeing quite a lot of people recently on uh, in various parts of the country saying, oh, guess what? I saw a, um, a policeman on the beat today um, in some part of Cornwall or in some part of Lincolnshire and, you know, amazingly, the people that would normally be hanging around sort of being a nuisance and, and sort of getting involved in antisocial behaviour weren't doing it. We haven't been wasting our time for all these years yeah. when we've been banging on about it. Yeah. People and others, of course, have been loud voices as well. Hopefully, the yeah. police are listening. There's an awful lot of work to be done and there is still many, many things about policing that they've got to get much, much mm. better. But we don't want social work. We don't want police playing politics. Yeah. They've got to grow up, especially the senior police yes. who prowl the corridors of power right. and think that it's all rather wonderful mm. to be in the corridors of the House of Commons, for example. Oh, yes. And those kind of places. Right. What they've got to realise is that ideologically, whether it's far left or far right of politics, 
The police are seen as a great oppressor. No. So politicians don't really like the police no. on an ideological level. No. So don't try and make friends with them. No. Have whatever interactions you need to, but focus on policing. Give the public yeah. what they want. People being rugby tackled, people being whacked if need be, tasered if mm. need be, and dare I say it, shot if need be. Yeah. And deal with it. Do some policing. The public love it, want it. I mean, there's no it. shortage of bad guys out there. There's plenty of work to be done. I mean, they always say we haven't got enough police. Well, get some more police and do some more of that. Yeah, get away from the social work. Mm. If police officers love the social work side of it, you know, and they enjoy mm. sitting behind a desk and doing stuff which isn't remotely connected to frontline policing, then go and be a social worker yeah. and let somebody else exactly. come into the police who wants to nick bad people. Yeah. It's not very difficult, this, is it? Even the commissioner said he would like to be undercover. He said it today. Mm. He'd like to be undercover. If they need an oldie yeah. to pose as a victim, right. well, I know Sir Mark <laughs> Rowling's face is pretty kind of recognisable, right. but I'd pay for the uh, for the aesthetics. Yeah. So, you know, wigs and a different yeah, nose yeah. Why not? and all that kind of stuff. We're getting some training from an actor to walk with a stoop or yeah. with a stick, make him look incredibly vulnerable yeah. because he holds the officer constable still. He might be commissioner, but he's also a constable. What a thing that would be if the commish got a little bit of undercover mm. training, went out, was a decoy and contributed to yet more bad people getting locked up. I'd love it. I think most people would love it. Brilliant stuff. Peter, good to see you. Thank you very much indeed. Peter Blexley there um, talking about what most people, I think, say is a massive blight on our society all over the place, just robbing people on the street, not being able to go out at night without fear of being attacked, that kind of thing. We'll sort it out. We'll get to it. Let's talk about The Guardian, because yesterday uh, they published an article which suggested you should hug a stranger to go over your fear of rejection. So, you know me, I thought I'd give it a go. So today we're doing an experiment, a social experiment, and it's something that The Guardian suggested. Apparently they think it's a good idea to go and hug some strangers. So let's go. Okay, Joe. Would you like a hug? I'd like nothing more. Come with me. <laughs> Good times. Yeah, Good times. Tom, oh, would you like a hug? No, thank you. No. <laughs> no. No. Not get a hug here. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. Sorry, a hug. Could you get a hug? A hug. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. All right. Free. Yeah. Absolutely free. Free hug. Yeah. See, people are up for this. Yeah. That's long enough. What do you think of that? Brilliant. There you go. Brilliant. Thank you, Ellie. You're welcome. Yeah. Hug someone. You know it makes sense. Now, um, uh, that was quite weird, but not as weird as this. That's enough hugging now. Get lost. Off you go. Go on. We've got serious business to get on with now. That was just a sort of a slight, um, shall we say, detour. I'm amazed The Guardian is now in the business of uh, suggesting that men should go around hugging people at random. Mm. I mean, imagine doing that in a Guardian office. You wouldn't be... Um, Scary. I don't think you'd get too many people being uh, very happy about it. But anyway, uh, I'm glad to say we've finally got the panel in here. Uh, we've got barrister and writer Stephen Barrett, we've got columnist at Spikes Online, Ella Whelan, and William Clouston, uh, leader of the Social Democratic Party. Yeah. Seen you for a while, William. No, it's I been a while. I assume you're still leader of the, the Social Democratic Party. Yeah, we're Party. still plugging away. Excellent. Good to see you all. Yep. Uh, well, there's so much <coughs> to talk about tonight. Um, I don't know, where should we begin? I suppose we should begin with the Rwanda nonsense because, uh, Stephen, you are, as I've often said, the legal department <coughs> uh, representation here tonight. Um, I just had um, Ivan Sampson on earlier on today, who I thought was talking absolutely not a balderdash when he said that, uh, you know, it's not for the parliament to make rules which are in some way in breach of international law. Surely it's quite obvious that that's what they should be doing. Yes, and um, lawyers who speak in public and say that international law is superior to our own law are, are not merely wrong. They're also distinctly anti-democratic. Yes because the fundamental principle, and we, we had a civil war about this, no. but we did not want to be ruled by an autocratic dictator, a, a monarch, a, a king. Yes. We wanted to be ruled by a democratic parliament, and they are sovereign. And international law is the law of sovereigns. It's mm. contracts between promises. Yes. B between princes. And it, it is never binding 
upon those of us who are merely in the state. Mm. There's an argument that it is binding on the government, which depends very much upon the, the international law in particular, but it's never binding on parliament. Parliament can do whatever mm. it wants yeah. and whatever mm. it considers necessary in our defence and in our protection. And, you know, the, this issue of immigration is quite clearly, uh, for whatever, uh, however you see it, it, it is about national security. Yeah. And also Parliament, William, is for the people, isn't it? I mean, it is the people, effectively. It may not feel like it very often. It may not represent us as we would like it to, but that's their job, isn't it? We elect, we elect them to do what we want them to do. That's true, but we have a generation of politicians that are useless, used to... These so being useless, being useless. Well, they are useless as well. <laughs> they, they're used to uh, outsourcing all this stuff, yeah. so they don't take any responsibility. Mm. Uh, Stephen's quite right. The, we can choose to incorporate some international law if we want, and yeah. we can abide, but we can also choose not to do right. so. That's the key. So the that responsibility. That must be surely our right as a nation. Res responsibility, right? yeah. If you believe in sovereignty and democracy, it is basics, absolute basics. So this whole thing, and we'll get onto the detail in a bit, possibly, but the whole thing, no one is going to Rwanda. No. This is a I think the detail is, is a pointless exercise it's, to even look at, look at. It's a little bit of theatre in the West End. Yeah. Isn't it, it is. It's I don't think, else. Ella, anybody in their right mind would say to, to you or me or, or either of uh, the panel, that this is actually going to work. And it's been a kind of pointless exercise. I described it yesterday as a bit like watching The Wizard of Oz and waiting for Toto to pull the curtain back and there's this guy mm. in a suit mm. whose name is Rishi Sunak and he's just sort of playing with some, some toys. Well, we've had quite... I mean, we're sort of used to these, like, supposedly nail-biting moments in Parliament, particularly, you know, because the Conservative Party has been at the brink of... Or you know, it seems to be at the brink of collapse several times. Yes. Even mm. going back to Theresa May's sort of era, there right. were all these mm. votes and moments of potential split. Maybe it's fatigue with us that I don't think anyone was that excited by, even among the sort of political commentariat. But also within you know their own, among their own ranks, all the rebels turn out to be not very rebellious at all. Mm. Um, the bill turns out to have a pretty smooth ride, and no one is really that fussed about right. it. And I think it's probably because. They know that this isn't, a, it's not a sort of solution that's going to put a lid on the issue. Because, you know, as much as there is, as Stephen has outlined very well, the sort of legal, um, the history of, of what a parliament can and can't do or what it should and shouldn't be allowed to do and the problem with lawyers and all of this, but there is this fudge that the government's going to have to get over at some point right. or face, which is that you have a fundamental clash of um, international law, international rules, courts, somewhere else, the ECHR, versus... Um, what you and I and Joe Bloggs vote for and expect to be put into practice um, in terms of politics. And, you know, at the moment, Rishi you know, has got David Cameron high up, who's obviously come in and given his opinion behind the scenes about don't even go yeah. there with the ECHR. Right. You know, you could feel a shift with all of that. They're not going to do anything... Um, you know, they're basically briefing now, suggesting they're briefing civil servants to say... Just don't worry about just it. Just don't do it. Just yeah. do what we mm. say. Don't worry. It's not that. And also the it's other all a pretense. Of, the other massive failing of it is that you're asking people who commit um, breaches of the law on a daily basis, who run criminal gangs, mm. running drugs, guns, people, whatever you like, brothels. You're asking them to obey a law. Well, yeah. of course they're not going to obey it, are they? Because they don't obey laws. It's like asking people who drive cars without insurance to get insurance. Sorry, it's the, not happening. The, the really sad thing is, Mike, that this is so frustrating for the public because. There's a big political constituency who want a secure border, and we're not asking for very much. I've, I've no. made the point so many times. We want this sorted, and yet it's really surprising from a political point of view. So forget the, you know, put the legals to the side. Why, why on earth did Sunak pin his sort of flag to something which is completely unworkable and can't work? Right. It's, totally, it's like I need to get through this week or this month. Mm. But in the end, he, this isn't. No one's going to Rwanda. No. This won't be sorted out under this government, and he has to face the public yeah. in a general election. Do you think it disastrous? Might be, I mean, I don't know if you saw today that rather obscure, which which really pathetic kind of um, attack ad that they put out, yeah. um, in which they referred to um, Keir Starmer as, as uh, you know better call better call Keir, a bit like better call Saul, you know, making out that he's um, an enabler 
of terrorists and it's gutter politics. Yeah, it really is, yeah. and it's and it's and I mean it's just pathetic, really, because he's a lawyer, and you know I haven't got much time for Keir Starmer, um, but there is also a principle that you do have to defend people from time to time. I'll have a go at him if he chooses to go and defend particular individuals, but if he's on what they call the cab rank and all of that, mm. you know he's clearly not a, an enabler for terrorism. He mm. clearly would try to put people away if they'd done something wrong. You know, we can all argue about what he did in the past and all the rest of it. But, you know, maybe, maybe in some kind of twisted way, I don't know, Stephen, if you think of this, that Sunak wanted to see the Labour Party stop them so he could say, well, you stopped me doing the boats and that's your fault. Well, I think it's, it's interesting to pick up on a point that, that William has made because the, 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 there's something that I like to return to in that we seem to still believe that we should do theatre and new law. Yeah. And you govern a country by doing a bit of theatre, being, by be, being a bit, a little bit controversial, which that ad clearly is, getting a bit of attention and passing a new law, when actually all that anybody really wants and, and this applies to the Met as well. I mean, the, no, the Met, Metropolitan Police don't need new laws. Right. They need to enforce the laws they have. Yes, mm. but we just saw what they were doing yeah. today mm. uh, in an alleyway in the West End of London. Mm. Carry on doing that and yeah. you'll cut crime overnight. Exactly, and there is a massive public outcry for enforcement rather than mm. new laws. Yeah. And I mean, the, the, the small boats invasion could be declared a national emergency. It could yeah. be dealt with Easy. now. You That's don't true. need new law. Mm. So we get these, and I get, I mean, I get caught up in it, of course I do, because I, I'm a lawyer and I love the technical arguments, but, you know, I am a bit of a nerd, I'll, I'll admit that. Your viewers don't have to be nerds like me. They, they just need to know that, that this isn't really necessary. What, right. You know, protecting our border is not that complicated. We, we have actually fought wars before. Mm. We, we can, the, the British state is actually capable of remarkable right. turnaround speed. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if Russia were, were going to invade in six hours, all sorts of things would right. become possible. Yes. And what we're not seeing, or what we are seeing, is this reluctance in Parliament to admit that. They, well, they'd did... rather do the theatre yes. the, and the, what William called the gutter politics. Obviously, I don't, I don't have a view on that, but, you know, they'd rather do the theatre of it yeah. rather than actual substance. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the thing about this, that sort of advert is it's just, it feels like a, an, an open goal because the only it's answer to crap, that is... Well, the only answer to that is you are the ones that are in yeah. power. Mm -hmm. You right. are the one, and for quite a long time, right. by the way, and, I'm, you know, I think most of us know that some of these problems stretched beyond the Conservative... Before the Conservative yeah. government have been sort of decades in the making. But, I mean, Christ, you've been the ones that have been able to do mm. something mm. about this, mm. particularly in relation to terrorism, particularly in relation to national security, over the last sort of 10, 15 years. So, I mean, you, you just can't put the blame like that. But I think it, this all comes back to the fact that, in particular, Rishi Sunak encapsulates this very well for me. The Conservative Party at the moment is... is split and then it's each one of them is half worried about how they look on the international mm. stage yeah. they stay yeah. they're all let's remember how many of them were remainers mm. yeah. and that's not a sort of cheap point it's saying no. that they still yeah. very much care how they're seen in europe they don't want to go near the echr they don't want to do anything nasty around international law mm. or do anything controversial mm. yeah. and that means that they this rwanda plan is a perfect opportunity to look like you're doing something yeah. I think they probably hoped it wouldn't have yeah. backfired this bad. Yeah. But it's a big sort of splash. Yes, new law yeah. will the, do something, yeah. knowing that it won't work. I actually think it's that cynical. I, I think, think they so. knew it would it, hold, that, hold that thought, William, because we've got to just take a little break. But we're going to come back. We're going to talk about the royals. We're going to talk about all manner of other things as well. Um, also, Tom Kerridge, too. Um, you're watching the tremendous Independent Republican Mike Graham. After the break, we'll be jetting off once more. We're going to be talking about a teacher who accused colleagues of blackophobia. She's won a discrimination claim. That story has a penthouse in the world of woke. And we'll look at the headlines in all tomorrow's papers again. See you after this. We're as well. criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. 
for the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast ah, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are Just you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now, it's time for this. Have you heard about the phobia that dare not speak its name? It's not the usual homophobia or Islamophobia. It's not even arachnophobia or agoraphobia. No, there's a new one out there, and it's been coined by a primary school teacher from Manchester, and she's just won a tribunal case for discrimination. So it must be real, right? It all started when Andrea Mari's voice uh, was let go from her job after 20 years, after six fellow staff at Kings Road Primary School sent her relentless complaining about racial issues in the classroom left them all feeling a bit intimidated. She said she was victimised because those same colleagues were practising blackophobia. That's it, right there, a new term and probably a whole new legal definition for a phalanx of lawyers to make a bucket load of money. According to evidence brought before the tribunal, Miss Mayers continually objected to the use of the word black. She also said that a visiting magician should not refer to the pupils as little monkeys, which resulted in the school banning the word altogether. Not only that, but library books were then removed, art displays were taken down, and the nursery caption classes were forced to stop singing a song called Five Little Monkeys. Teachers launched a collective grievance against Miss Mayers, insisting they were too afraid to use the word black in her presence for fear of being accused of racism. Six of them even threatened to stage a wildcat strike, but she's now come out on top having successfully sued the school and the local council for discrimination. Her compensation will be uh, decided at a later date. But isn't all this wokery now reaching epidemic levels of stupidity? Let's not forget the compensation will come directly from taxpayers for this. In one incident, Ms Mayer said it was inappropriate for a black child to wear a sticker that said, Black Current. She said it was a microaggression. She also objected when she was asked to help out with Black History Month because there was already someone dealing with it. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what we have become. And it ain't pretty. Let's hope it doesn't cause an avalanche of blackophobia claims from professional victims. Somehow, though, I fear that that is what will happen because that is the world of woke. So there's a new phobia for us all to worry about. Um, let's look at some other stories from tomorrow's papers, though. And we should, I suppose, guys, look at uh, the royal story. I don't know where you all were. Or is it one of those where you remember where you were when they said that the Princess of Wales is in hospital and King Charles is, has, has got an enlarged prostate? Do you care? I mean, it's quite, well, a, it's quite a significant moment. It, I don't know why they put them both out on the same day. Well, maybe they, they are 
concurrent, aren't they? So that's part of it. But it, actually, he deserves credit for mentioning it because the issue is a big Charles issue. does, yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course. And, I mean, it could have been kept quiet, couldn't it? So... Well, I mean, I think that would have been a mistake. I'm just curious as to who decided to release first the news about mm. the Princess of Wales and then follow it literally less than two hours later with news about the King. Mm. There must have been a reason for doing it like that, must not there? Yeah, possibly. But anyway, it's a, it's a big issue for all men and men should get checked and yeah. bring it up to public attention. But, of course, Kate's getting all the publicity on the front yeah. pages Not as sure. opposed to him. Yeah. I'll be there for Kate, says William. Because there is, I mean, a constitutional a qu question here. I had Robert Jobson in earlier. And there is uh, a sort <clears> of <throat> series of successions which they apparently haven't yet worked out. And there could well be a situation, I know it's very remote, where either Andrew or Harry gets called upon to do some kind of functionary duty. It's, it's it, what I would say on this, because whatever you think about the royals is your personal political opinion. Yeah. But we have a constitution with a living monarchy. Mm. As a result of that, the health of those living, of, of the living monarch and of the successors is always going to be constitutionally important. Yes. It's always going to be on the front page of a newspaper. You know, the, the uh, America's um, supremo, if you like, the, the top of its economy, is, is a document that they can put in a cabinet and they yeah. can go to a museum and they can all they can all bow to, well every morning at, at, at school they they pledge allegiance to, mm. to their document yeah. mm. we don't have that we have living flesh we have a living constitution which is real and human and so we are inevitably engaged in this in this type of thing but I mean people don't have to care but they will inevitably yes. be told the health of the royal family well I do think it's I mean fair well, you know, I take the point, fair play to him for being open about it because it's something that affects all, well, many, many, men. many men. Um, and uh, actually, one of the things that's interesting is that he's getting treatment for it. And I think a lot of men out there suffer with, I just think that it's something that happens to them when they're yes. old mm. and don't realise that you can actually do something about it. But it is remarkable that the front pages of the paper are talking about steam treatment for the king yeah. in such an intimate area. I don't want to make light of it, but I do just think <laughs> there's something about... New, new generation of royals that is, yeah. is slightly too far from There me. might I be don't too much information that. Yeah. that you're saying, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I said this when, when we didn't know about Charles, but we did know about Kate, and I said, I'm not interested in you know, sort of speculating about what it might be that mm. she's got a problem with. I mean, it's none of my business, really. I don't mm. think it's any of, any of our business to ask mm. for intimate details of anybody's no. medical condition, and I think that's fair enough, yeah. you know. And there might have been a time years back when, when, when tabloid newspapers were a little bit more inquisitive than that. You know, it, it's it's interesting with politicians actually because the there's a famous book on Churchill's health written by his physician. Yeah, and, and so there's a whole there is a history of politicians' health, and you know you, you might have a prime minister on barbiturates making serious de well, decisions. Well, they used to say that about JFK, didn't they? That yeah, he had terrible he'd, back pain. Back and he pain, was yeah. constantly taking painkillers, which may or may not have affected his yeah. his mood. So we, I think the third. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So that you know, it may, it's slightly different with the royals, but certainly. There's a big history of politicians hiding their, their illness when yes. they're the head of state. You know, it's very common. Absolutely right. Um, let's talk about health from another perspective. There was a video that was released um, earlier on today, I think it was, up in Scotland. This is NHS Scotland. It's not actually in the papers mm. at the moment, but we had a look at the video. I think we've got it here. Basically, up in Scotland, they've apparently decided nobody knows how to deal with cold weather. Yeah. So they've actually issued this as a method of staying safe so that when you walk down an icy street... Yeah. You walk like a penguin, yeah. and that will mean that you will not fall over. Yeah. It's been roundly criticised and ridiculed because it's just really ludicrous, isn't it? You know, one, you could try gritting the <laughs> streets. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just I find it incredible that we now live in this nanny state where they're telling you how to do practically everything, how to walk down the street now without falling over. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's going to work, is it? I'm sure I've slipped over walking like that. I mean, yeah. I mean, if, just... you've, if you're walking on a street which is covered in ice, you're going to fall over. Yeah. Right? Just grit the road. Yeah. Just, you know... And but, you know, so many councils now, don't, all the time. they don't even buy grit anymore. Because no. they say, oh, we don't really need it for 52 weeks of the year. Mm. We only need it for one week of the year. It's, so we don't buy it anymore. It's got the whiff of the policy expert somewhere in NHS Scotland, hasn't it? Did you know, Mike, since 2016, we've got 6,000 more government advisors on policy yes. matters. So this is a, probably a policy me. person saying, you know, if you do this, you'll save X number of uh, hip operations or broken legs, whatever, yeah. and they'll be worth it. And we'll they'll put it, it under the, 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 the heading of preventative medicine. Right? Yeah, yeah. Even though it's just a video. Well, yeah. I, I object to it because policy is the role of elected officials. Mm. So having 
paid officials to do policy seems mm. to me constitutionally right. uh, wrong. It's a bit of a stretch to call it policy, isn't it? Well, I, I don't. I really don't know what it was. <laughs> I'm only guessing. What, what I'm only guessing. Th yeah. There is a prevailing political <laughs> attitude, and it's whether you like it or, or dislike it, that the state is better off at running your life than than you are. Yeah. And whether that pendulum has reached a point where it's going to swing back, or whether the pendulum is going to go further, we shall see. On a human interest level, yeah. I, my um, child has always uh, believed that her grandfather runs like a penguin. Right. And from a very young age has loved penguins as a deep as a deep reaction. And and as a two-year-old at a zoo faced with a large bronze penguin, hugged it and said Bampa <laughs> because, because that there is this penguin connection. So I feel very familiar yes. with penguins, but penguins um, are great. Perhaps I mean, don't really need the tip I'm a on great supporter of they used to some great penguins at Edinburgh Zoo, actually, mm. um, who walk like penguins and don't fall over. Don't fall funnily over. enough. Yeah. So maybe there is something in it. Um following on from that Rishi Sunak um Keir Starmer nastiness. Uh, the Times have got a piece, uh, not so, about, so much about that uh, poster, but mm. just saying that uh, they're having uh, that Starmer is having is being attacked by Rishi Sunak because he actually did give advice to Hibstut Tahir. I think that's the right way to say it. Hibstut Tahir, rather, yeah. who have now just been declared to be a terrorist organisation, which started the process, I think, in 2005. Tony Blair was supposed to declare them to be a terrorist organisation, and it's taken until now for James Cleverly to do it. Yeah, so when he gave the advice, they weren't. Uh, I think this is, again, bad politics. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it'll play... It's very short-term attacking him this way. It'll probably get worse. I mean, I think the, we're going to get this all... Actually, the Labour Party's yeah. pretty bad as well. They're, they're the terrible duo are doing... Oh, well, they did loads of sin, yeah, yeah, didn't and, they? Uh, and soon he I, doesn't yeah. care about your children being attacked yeah, by well, paedophiles. But also rubbish. Yeah, and also childishness. So the people that are in charge of the Twitter fees, and you see this on the Tory side and the Labour side, Labour side decided to show a video of... Uh, a clip of Sunak trying to hammer something with the side of a hammer. Yes. Saying his dad wasn't a toolmaker. This is honestly, just continue doing that. And no one will vote for these parties. Well, this is why there's such disaffection, isn't there? In, yeah. In, in, yeah. The, in the, in the big wide behavior. world. Childish behaviour. They're just fed up with them. Yeah. Um, train tickets costing double at machines, apparently, according to the Telegraph. Commuters are being charged up to twice as much to buy train tickets and machines compared to booking online. And this is again what the RMT says, isn't it? This is why. Um, we must have ticket offices to make sure that people who can't buy tickets online can actually buy them somewhere else. I've given up travelling by train. I just don't bother anymore. Mm. People that I know that do it find themselves incredibly frustrated. Well, you don't want to sound like a Luddite, but it does. But there is so much that doesn't work unless you actually are able to talk to a human being. Yeah, I've just right. spent two hours on the phone to an internet company that shall not be named, and uh, you know, to the point where I was almost. Screaming, yes. just please. Well, do you know make what happened to end? me this week? I took my daughter to Heathrow just between Christmas and New Year, and there's a drop off place where you drop them off, and then you're supposed to pay a fee. And of course, I completely forgot to pay it because you're not allowed to sit there and pay it because if you do that, uh, you get charged extra for sitting there too long. So I just now got a fine for it, you know, 40 quid for yeah. literally spending about a minute in a, in a zone. Where you, there's no other way of paying, you can it only stinks. pay online. Yeah. See, a lot of these things may actually be challengeable. Yeah. And what happens because in my lifetime as a barrister, access to justice has rescinded. Yes. So little things don't get thought about in the way that they no. probably should. Mm. Mm. And the behaviour of train companies over the last 10, 15 years mm. has been deeply questionable. Yes. The way that you turn up to a machine and it tells you, oh, you have to do this. Yeah. yeah. That, that's not free and fair contract. Which right. Is what the law expects. But they make it more difficult, don't they? Because it's like if your train is late and you're supposed to claim compensation, yeah, it's such a complicated process that you just give up and go, it, I'm not bothering. But well, that, that was the EU solution. So yeah. we'd, we'd end up with a bad legal system, and but you'd be able to get compensation for it. Yeah. And you worked it, hard enough for it. it it's yeah. out of our... If it's, you it's, not, it's not our normal system. Our no. normal system would be much more simplified. And this point I've, I've, I often try to make, Mike, and I really must write about it, is that I think that there is a constitutional duty in this country for law to be understandable yes, for everyone. absolutely. Because ignorance of the law is no defence. So you, you'll be held guilty yeah, yeah, if you didn't yeah, yeah. know what the law is. At the same time, our law should be understandable for everyone. Yes, and you shouldn't need a lawyer to understand no. it. Whereas in America, where I lived for 10 years, you couldn't mm. do anything without a lawyer. Mm. And that's kind of where we're going now. Mm. Finally, for anybody who smokes, I don't know if any of you do, um, smokers are apparently getting charged even more money. Inflation is driving prices up. So... Just give up, is what I said. Yeah, say. I'm, I'm an ex-smoker. I was. It took me three times to give yeah. up. I was on sort of 50 a day before. Well, so, yeah, listen, good idea. It's all over.
I'm afraid. <laughs> no. um, I'm glad you gave up. <laughs> but, but that's all for me. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to go. Um, you've been watching Independent Republic of Mike Graham. It's been another fabulous show. Thank you to all of you for coming. Um, thank you. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using Excel bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we